Someday you wish upon a star Wake up where the clouds are far behind Be where trouble melts like lemon drops High above the chimney top that's where What a wonderful world The colors of the rainbow So pretty in the sky Are also on the faces Of people going by I see friends shaking hands Saying hi more than I never knew and I think to myself what a wonderful world yes I think to myself what a wonderful You got a friend in me. 
you got a friend in me. so many songs about rainbows and what's on the other side rainbows are visions but only illusions and rainbows have nothing to hide
Stop your crying, it will be all right. Just take my hand, hold it tight. I will protect you from all around you. I will be here, don't you cry. For I'm so small, you seem so strong. My arms will hold you, keep you safe and warm. This bond between us can't be broken. I will be here, don't you cry? Cause you'll be in my heart. Yes, you'll be in my heart. From this day on, now and forever. Hi, I'm Barry Campbell, otherwise known as Jesse's dad, and that's a good title. <laughs> thank you. I just want to say uh, thank you on behalf of Jesse's family. Thank you for being here, but uh, more importantly, thank you for being a friend to Jesse. He loved you, and clearly you loved him. So I just want to introduce a couple of people that will be coming up in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Randy Adams is here. Uh, Randy is a dear friend, and he's in, in our church we have what's called a convention. It's um, a cooperation of churches that believe the same stuff and do stuff the same way as we do. And we do things together that none of us could do apart alone. And Randy is a leader of that group. It's called a convention. But he's a friend, and he's going to come and share in a little bit. But uh, just right now, Austin Evans is going to come. And Austin is a part of the Foundry Church in Bend, where Jesse lived about half a block and where he attended. And just want to make those two introductions. So a lot of different kind of things are going to be happening. People from different parts of the community are going to be coming. And let's make this a real celebration of Jesse's life. Austin. After uh, reading the playbill and the, watching the slideshow, it just feels like an amazing honor to be <laughs> up here among all the people Jesse got to interact with in his life, all the movie stars and, and uh, characters. Uh, he, I feel honored to, that he chose me as a friend. I'm Austin, and 
can't, I can't tell you exactly why Jesse chose, chose me to be his friend. Um, he did show up at Foundry Church several years ago, and uh, he just, he came, he came up to me and, and started being my friend, and uh, he's probably at that point, I thought friendship was really defined by finding somebody who liked the same things as you and liked to do the same things as you, and Jesse and I couldn't have been more different in that regard. <laughs> Um, for many years, I, I just tried to enjoy all the stories about the movies that I really couldn't care about, um, the TV shows. <laughs> um, but one thing I learned from Jesse is that what a friend really is, at least, at least if you have Jesus in common, is just somebody you choose to love. And Jesse chose to love me, and I chose to love him, and we got together uh, as often as we could uh, before, before he... I lost his hearing. We, we'd probably meet weekly or every other week for breakfast. He, of all my friends, he's the only one that will get up. He would get up at 6 o'clock to have breakfast with me um, because that's the time I like to get up and eat breakfast. And I don't know if he ever enjoyed that, just like I didn't really enjoy the movies he, he took me to. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so great. It's so great to spend time with him uh, before and after he lost his hearing. The nice thing about after he lost his hearing about getting together with him is I have a recording of all the conversations because we had to text or I had to text my part to him and uh, I have a lot of great memories from that I don't I don't know how I'm gonna save those I'll figure a way um, the last thing he asked me just incidentally is if I'd go to the Joker movie with him and of course I told him no <laughs> like I always did I did go to some movies with him and it was really fun because he was so into it um, but I've got a family I've got little kids he didn't it just didn't make sense. Um, you know, his, his life shouldn't have intersected with mine. But it did because of our shared love for the Lord. And um, just a few, I was just scrolling back to some historical text. But it was just a few weeks ago when he told me he really wanted to be coming back to our life group. Our life group was just the small group that he had been a part of for probably the better part of that 10 years. And on and off. But whenever he could. And he's been, he had been to our house and... And I just, it, I could always rely on him to be a good contributor. I, I, you know, the rest of the life group usually was pretty quiet when I'd ask a question, but not Jesse. And um, it was, just, I miss, I miss those days. But he, it had been a long time since he'd come because of uh, health reasons. He couldn't, he couldn't really participate that well. Uh, but he had texted me. He said, I'm planning on being there. I'm going to be going, uh, coming to the life group finally. And, uh, and he said, he just said, I just really need. I just really need Christian friends. And I see all those pictures, all those that slideshow, and, and I think about all the people that he loved and loved him. But really, what he wanted deep down was Christian friends. So I, I'm I'm happy to say I was that for him. Um, and now, of course, he's got all the Christian friends he can imagine right now. He got his dream, and I'm going to share a passage. When Jesus was getting ready to leave, he was really just kind of explaining to his disciples. But that's all they needed, too, was a friend, a Christian friend. He said in John 14, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that you may be where I am. So, you, so that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. Lord Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, Jesse. We thank you for the life that, that he lived here on earth and the friends that he was able to make because of his joy and his love and just the, the ability to um, be himself and teach others how to love more deeply. He taught me how to be a better friend, how to be a better person. And now I thank you so much that he gets to be with the ultimate friend forever and ever now. Thank you that you are that friend, that you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. Amen. The sun will come out 
tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. Just thinking about tomorrow clears away the cobwebs and the sorrow till there's none. When I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely, I just stick up my chin and grin and say, the sun will come out tomorrow, so you gotta hang on till tomorrow. Come what may, tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you tomorrow, you're always a day. I'm Marcy Campbell, otherwise known as Mom. <laughs> also known as his adventure buddy. So, after having meningitis, I think it would run through his head that he might not um, have a long, long life. And so he wanted to be prepared. He always planned way, 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 way ahead for everything in every detail. So he said, Mom, I don't want one of those sad, crying funerals. He said, I want a celebration. He said, I'm going to be OK. He said, I'll be fine. He said, I want it to be a happy time, like a party. And he said, my only regret is that I won't be there with all my friends to party with them. And boy, could he plan a party. They, he was famous for those. Sometimes we'd have 60 at his birthday party. It just, whoever showed up, and, and uh, he had so, so many friends, and, but he loved. He planned every detail of it. I, uh, looking back on that slideshow, I just have to tell you, the, the picture with the mustache that was drawn on, he wanted to be Gomez, and uh, so before I got there, he got out the permanent Sharpie. <laughs> and he said, how'd I do? <laughs> and we, we learned that Don will take it off. But he said, I, I think I did pretty well. He said, for a guy who has horrible uh, fine motor skills, I think I did pretty well. <laughs> Since he was five, he would win on radio contests. He would win movie tickets. He would win, win dinners, Dove Award tickets. I, he won everything. He won two guitars, uh, one that had traveled all the way across country, was full of, of uh, autographs. He won one guitar because he was working on losing weight, and he would go in at the cancer center to weigh, and uh, he noticed that they had a donation thing for uh, uh, cancer patients. And so he put in a $5 donation and, and got a ticket out of it, not expecting to get anything from it. And out of the whole county, they drew his ticket, and he won the guitar. <laughs> but that was Jesse. He was always giving and always doing and, and loved people. Uh, but... We would go to these TV shows, and they would just happen. I mean, things just happened to Jesse. He would meet stars. He would, he would just happen to get to be at a, at a TV show taping. And uh, sometimes he would plan it and get tickets three months in advance. He'd put in for them because you have to get chosen for them. And so he had gotten uh, tickets to one show, and I wasn't particularly wanting to go to that show because I didn't particularly like it. And... Um, he said, Mom, we have to go, because Candace Cameron, uh, what's her last, was going to be on there, and we need to go and support her. <laughs> and so uh, we got there, and they took our phones, and, and you couldn't record anything. And so he told the stage guy, uh, you know, I had a crush on her on Full House when I was younger, and that just left it there. 
and he told her, and she came out in the audience, and, and he told her that how much it had meant to him uh, when he had meningitis, and he was not able to even move, and he watched her new show, Fuller House, and how it brought laughter to him, and she cried and hugged him, and it was, this was after uh, the pre-Jesse show, where he had done the dance-off, and had his backup dancers, and um, <laughs> So I'm missing all this on, on uh, my camera, but the stage guy got it all, and he sent it to my phone after it was over. But those were the kinds of things. Um, I remember one time we went to David Copperfield, which he had won the tickets to right down front, and they picked me out of the audience to disappear. <laughs> so uh, after the show, I'm trying to think what I can tell him because I don't want to tell him too much and David Copperfield make me disappear for good. So I, I, I'm telling him, yes, he came around and he gave the ladies a kiss on the cheek and he shook hands with the guys and I'm telling him a little bit about what happened as we disappeared. And so he calls Barry, it's about midnight, and he calls him, he was a, Jesse was a young guy, and he calls and says, Dad? Um, David Copperfield made mom disappear backstage and he kissed her, but she didn't kiss him back. Bye. <laughs> I called him back quickly and said, there's more to this story. <laughs> he won tickets to the Dove Awards and we had been watching. I, th I think it's pretty good. We have good seats and, and the Dove Awards is going on where he's seeing all the main Christian artists singing. He said, I have to go meet some people. I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> so he's gone about 30 minutes and I'm thinking, I'm missing out on something here. So I went to find him and he had figured out where they were coming and going off stage and he wasn't bothering them. Uh, going on stage, but as they came off, he would get their autograph and talk to him a few minutes. And so I, I, when I came walking up, he was talking to David, um, oh, Katie, what's his name? The guy on the poster that you had on your wall. Toby Mac. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was a young girl, and she had a big Toby Mac poster on her wall. So he was just hanging out with him. They'd been hanging out for a while. And uh, he said, quick, give me your phone, Mom. I said, oh, okay, and gave him my phone. And uh, he said, if I call my little sister, would you say hi to her? And <laughs> so he said, sure. So he called her up, and he said, hey, Katie, this is Toby Mac. And she's like, oh. <laughs> and... Um, he saw that worked real well. So as all the Christian artists would come off, he would say, hey, would you say hey to my sister Katie? And so Katie's never knowing who's going to be on the other end of the phone. Casting Crowns, Third Day, Michael W. Smith, T-Bone, all these people are calling up Katie. Hi, Katie. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he didn't, oh, Out of Eden came out and they said, oh, is that Katie? We want to talk to her. They'd heard backstage. <laughs> And then he said, you know, I didn't get to meet Michael Tate. He said, that's kind of disappointing. This was the night of my life, but I wish I could have met him. And so we're walking down the street, and he said, Mom, just pretend we're supposed to be on this street. I said, are we not supposed to be on this street? And he said, well, it is where they park their limos. And he just <laughs> knew stuff. And so um, if Michael Tate didn't come walking out that door... <laughs> And he had seen, he had won tickets the night before and saw Rebecca St. James and Michael Tate in uh, a rock opera, Christ, Christian rock opera. So he was telling how much he enjoyed it and everything, and they're talking. And he said, if I called my sister, would you say, <laughs> sure. He talked to Katie for over five minutes. And, and then uh, we saw Michael in the airport about three months later, and he said, he won't remember me, Mom. He walked up to him, and Michael says, behind the dumpster at the Dove Awards. <laughs> Jesse was quite memorable. I remember one time he got backstage ahead of me, and by the time I got back there, he was having um, chocolate cake with the Temptations in their limo. <laughs> I walked up, and he was saying, so you're the only living original Temptation, right? And uh, you're Otis, right? And the lady's just laughing that was with him. I love that question. You're the only original... <laughs> He partied with the Baja men in their party room. He went backstage. He met so many people. 
He was at Jay Leno, and Jay Leno called him up on stage, and they're talking about D23 and all of these things. And he says, uh, who's that woman down there? Oh, that's my mom. Mom, come on up. <laughs> so then I'm on the Jay Leno show. Here we go. And uh, he said that meeting Stan Lee was the best three seconds of his life, uh, which Stan ended up sending him an autographed uh, uh, comic book in the mail after hearing about the best three seconds of his life. Um, he met Jimmy Fallon, Matthew Broderick, Chuck Norris. Um, he even asked Alec Trebek a question. <laughs> he met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, stars and um, superheroes and anybody you could imagine. He just had fun with that, just totally had fun. Um, I had many adventures with him, and I enjoyed the majority of them. <laughs> I did not enjoy the many nights when I had a hotel room right next door, but with a very nice bed, but we were sitting on concrete floors waiting to get in hall, whatever it is, hall C or whatever the big hall is, I should know by now, uh, where you could get in to meet the Avengers or you'd meet somebody or the Star Wars stars. And, and so we would, we would stay on those concrete floors and, and wait to be first in line. Um, another I didn't enjoy was I don't like on rides, I don't like drops. And he just loved Tower of Terror. <laughs> Mom, you have to do it. And, uh, you know, they'd open up that window and you're way above Disneyland. And I'm just picture him going out the window as we leave our seats. And it's just constant drops up and down. Well, they changed the name of it to Guardians of the Galaxy. It is still drops up and down. And <laughs> I did it, but I didn't particularly like those. But nothing would hold him back. He tried out for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. He tried out for American Idol. He had a really good song that was in his range, and then at the last minute he decided to do an Aguilera song. Uh, he tried out for The Price is Right. After going deaf, now you know he liked to karaoke, but he tried out for this lip sync contest. Now, to, for lip sync, you have to hear and sing along with the words. It didn't matter. It didn't hold him back. He tried out for this lip sync contest. Came in second. <laughs> he he didn't he didn't pick an easy song. He picked Weird Al's Yoda, which is a million words that you have to stay right together on. And he, he got this big Yoda head and put it on a stick. And during the chorus, he would hold it up and the whole place would just roar with the chorus of Yoda. And, uh, but nothing held him back. When he had meningitis and um, he, he went deaf and blind and paralyzed and aspirated on everything. He couldn't even roll over. And... Um, the Lord uh, healed him of many of those things. He got his eyesight back 2020. Uh, he went from being hoarder lifted into a wheelchair to using a wheelchair to using a walker to using a cane. And while in physical therapy, his determination was, I'm going to walk at Disneyland. And so that way he would push and push and push. Nothing held him back. And uh, just months after that, through rehab, I took him to Disneyland, and he walked 13,000 steps with that walker. He loved winning trivia contests, and uh, the hardest ones were the music and audio rounds. That would be where I would come in, and I would act out or say, it sounds like so-and-so singing, and uh, those, those were hard work. I was exhausted after those trivia games, but he would one night he won every round, and, and they said, uh, you can uh, share your gifts with others around him. Of course he did, because his love language was gifts. Um, he loved Mr. Rogers, and he often said that he wished that he had a show like Mr. Rogers that he could share with children and teach them good things. And he wanted to use his puppies like Mr. Rogers used his puppets. Um, his apartment... Okay, I have to tell you this. 
this all came from his apartment. <laughs> it was a fun apartment. But he would have to go into drawings to win those standees, and he did. Um, his life was a mixture of Marvel, Disney, theater, friends, and Jesus. You always knew where he stood. He was either way up or way down or very happy or he was sad, and the whole world knew it because it went on Facebook. <laughs> I would just go, oh, no, Jesse. Uh, but as you saw the slide, he did one of those tests on Facebook, and it showed 200% real and 0% fake. Uh, he was truly genuine. He was who he was, and you knew who he was, and uh, you knew he loved you with all his heart. His love language was gifts, and he always tried to pick out just the right thing that would make you smile. He was making a notebook for me that I came across when I was clearing out his apartment, and it was letters for mom. And uh, it was beautiful, and I lost it when I found that. But um, he loved hanging with his friends at church, at trivia, karaoke. He loved working. Um, he loved getting free movies at Regal. <laughs> and he loved that he could take one person with him free. I think my number of movies will probably cut down significantly now. Um, he had incredible birthday parties, and his infam infamous salad bowl game, it, it was hilarious, and it, you just would have had to have been there, I'm sorry, but <laughs> um, we laughed till we cried when he drew out Marilyn Monroe and had to act it out, and he did <laughs> the one with the dress, it was, uh, we cried. <laughs> But you knew exactly what it was. He was really good at it. Um, he, was a, um, he started out in college in Florida uh, doing um, uh, information systems with emphasis in audio and visual media. And then he came home and was working out on an elliptical and stepped off too quickly and broke both side support pieces in his ankle and was three and a half months non-weight bearing. And so he went to college where we lived and they didn't have that major, so he switched to radio. And he was a DJ and he did three shows a week. He did a, a hard rock one. I didn't listen to that one, that was the late night Saturday one. And he would close down the station and he would uh, uh, set it on automatic for Sunday. And he did the whole thing. and, and uh, he, he had fun with the oldies station, and I would listen to that because I wanted to hear what he was saying. Uh, many times he would start out with, uh, yeah, this morning mom said, and so <laughs> I always wanted to know what he was sharing because these stations went out all over Nashville and all the surrounding towns, and so it was interesting when your life was on the radio. Um, he loved to write. He couldn't write physically but he loved to make up stories and, and uh, he loved working with kids and he loved working in children's worship and going on mission trips and vacation Bible school and um, Sunday morning groups. And he just said that weekend, he said, I wonder how much, he had three years of college and he said, how much more would I need to do to go back to be a teacher? He said, I just love working with kids. He always looked out for the underdog. We all loved each other deeply as a family, and he all loved you deeply. He always loved music, and when he went deaf, um, he said music was what he missed most. And so a year ago Christmas, he was listening to music, and he said, Mom, I can hear the music. He said, it's my Christmas miracle. He said, I can actually hear it. It's not robotic. It sounds like instruments playing, and I can hear the music. And so that was uh, really important to him, that there were things that he could hear now, music-wise. That weekend, we arrived a little bit early, and half the team wasn't there yet. And so he said, we have to go show them Times Square. <laughs> and so he, he just had a ball. And he said, we have to go to Ellen's Stardust Diner. 
And uh, he had found that out because that day when he was in the dance hall and when he was meeting with Candace and all of those things, the couple next to us were just in awe and they wanted to hang out with us for the rest of the day. And so she told him about Ellen's and so they sang tomorrow to him at Ellen's. It's a place where they go and they kind of discover Broadway stars and they sing uh, songs there. And so they had, he had put in a request that day and he said, could you sing tomorrow? And they said, we don't usually do requests, but we're gonna do one for you. And they just sang their heart out and he absolutely loved it. Um, he planned ahead, he picked out the songs and he wanted them upbeat and happy because he wanted all of his friends to be happy. Um, that weekend, he had consoled a little girl that was crying by using one of his puppies and having it sing, Jesus Loves Me. And she was just crying uncontrollably. And then when he started singing, she just looked at him wide-eyed and started listening and stopped crying. Music played a big part in his life. He loved doing the cakewalk at our fall festivals here. And um, he was heading up the cakewalk there in New York at the fall retreat that afternoon on Sunday. And um, he picked out a movie and it was my favorite movie when I was little, and he knew that. And he had arranged for me to meet the star Cinderella, get her autograph and my picture with her at a Comic-Con. And uh, it was the Rodgers and Hammerstein's version. So he had pulled that up, and he said, Mom, here's our song. Let's sing it. And we sang one of the songs from it. And then he pulled up his sister's uh, favorite show, and he said, you look just like Katherine Heigl, and she's so beautiful, and so are you. And, and he, he knew that I had a crush on Prince Charming when uh, I was younger, and so he turned to Barry and he said, you know, you've aged a lot better than Prince Charming. I've seen him, and he looks awful, and you look really good. I said, well, what about me and Cinderella? He said, I've seen Cinderella. She still looks good, but you look better, Mom. <laughs> and then... Uh, he gave us these melting bear hugs before we went to bed. This was, uh, this was the night before he was gone. And uh, with the Asperger's and the autistic tendencies, I always had to say, Jesse, I'm coming for a hug. And, and sometimes he'd say, Mom, I can't take it right now. Um, and it would, hugs would actually be painful. And, but that night, it was either no or just this melting bear hug that would almost knock you over and he would just give you a hug with all of his body and he gave each of us that before he went to bed and he said how about we do some stories and so we went up and he was making up this story about uh dipstick was saying uh uh we're gonna have a ball and Lily is the little puppy who has Asperger's and ADHD, and she gets mixed up sometimes and takes things literally, and so she thought that they were gonna play fetch, and so he said, oh, no, 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 a ball, it's a big party, and everybody dresses up, and it's fun, and uh, it's, it's uh, and so he went on with the story, and then everybody lived happily ever after, and then he went to sleep, and then the next day, he's in heaven. Um, he was a little tiny preemie, and uh, he was just a little wad on my shoulder, and I thought it was interesting that when we brought back his ashes, he was almost identically the same weight in a little box that we got to bring back with us. I had a dream about him that first night. I only rested about an hour and a half the day that he went to heaven, and um, he always wanted to dress really stylishly, but he said, I'm so tired of ordering from big and tall, and, and they're just dorky looking. And he said, no matter how hard you try, you still don't look fashionable. And so he said, I, I'm looking forward to when I can walk in and just pick something off the rack and, and really stylish. And I had this dream, and it was white all around him, and he was standing there, and he was dressed in this double-breasted black suit, looking sharp with a white 
shirt and tie and these stylish shoes. And he was almost posed, and he had a full head of dark hair, and he had muscles, and his shoulders were square. And he was standing there, and he looked at me with this look. He didn't say anything, but he just looked at me with this look like, yeah, I got my perfect body now. And I just had to smile, and then I woke up. So now when I think of him, that's, that's what comes to mind. There is uh, one other thing I wanted to share with you. On my birthday in December, I opened up Facebook to find this. Happy birthday to my ageless, awesome mother, who makes Marion from Indiana Jones look like a pansy. You're my adventure buddy, the short round to my Indy, the Bucky to my Captain America, the Groot to my Star-Lord, the Leia to my Luke, the Archie to my Jughead, and the Bella to my Fat Amy. Hang on. There's one more thing. Thank you for loving Jesse and letting him love you with all of his heart. I'm going to miss my adventure buddy. Thank you, Marcy. We're going to invite you to stand and sing along with us if you'd like a couple of songs that Marcy referred to. The first one is Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. loves me. loves me he will stay close beside me all the way on the cross you died for me I will ever live for thee yes Jesus loves me
sound in your ear in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith. This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid in the depth of Christ I live oh, 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 oh sing that again of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me Just blood of Christ. Oh, 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 oh. in Christ alone. first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his 
his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, we stand. Amen. Seated. That song really captures the meaning of what it means to be a Christian and how it is and why it is that Christians have hope that the world doesn't have. By the way, Marcy, that was amazing. <laughs> Marcy just told me a couple of minutes ago that the last words that Jesse spoke there in the hospital as people were gathered around him, the uh, attendants and the hospital workers, he said, do any of you believe in God? She said it was really silent until one person said, I do, I believe in God. And Jesse said, would you pray for me? And those were the last words he spoke. This side of heaven this side of heaven. You know, to celebrate, to laugh as we've laughed, to uh, express gratitude and joy. Most people in the world cannot do that at the death of a young man. Grief is a common experience to all mankind, but joy is not. In fact, one person said that when they came to know Jesus, they were surprised by joy. Maybe you know the name C.S. Lewis. He said that was the thing that he was most taken by, was that he had never before experienced joy. And the reason that Jesse wanted today to be a day of celebration and a party isn't only because he enjoyed a party and an adventure, which he did, but he wanted today to be a celebration mostly and foremost because he had hope. He had life. He had a future to look forward to, even as it was expressed in Marcy's dream. He knew that the best was yet to come. It may well be that there are those here, friends of Jesse's, and that's not yet your faith. And you might even be somewhat baffled by how a person can confront death with joy and without this deep sense of foreboding. And I want to take you to a passage of Scripture that describes how and why it is that Jesse had that kind of hope and that kind of joy. I also want you to know that there are people praying for us right now. And following the memorial service, there are people who are praying now, who are going to be there in the, in the prayer area, just, just out that direction. And if you want to know more about what it means to have hope in Christ, they're there to talk with you and to pray with you and to help you as you seek life and joy and the kind of fearlessness that Jesse was able to have when he confronted this day. The very first Christian message, it's found in the book of Acts, and I say it's the first Christian message because this message was spoken just maybe days after Jesus ascended back to heaven, weeks after the resurrection and days after Jesus went back to heaven. The apostle Peter, who had been a fearful man, who had denied that he even knew Jesus, now only weeks later, having seen and spoken with the resurrected Lord, now was a man of such courage that he could say these words. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. And, and he was. Some of you know. Even if you haven't read the New Testament, you may have heard of the fact that Jesus walked on the water. And there was once a raging storm that threatened to kill his disciples, or at least they thought it did. And Jesus said, peace, be still. And the storm stopped. 
You might remember that Jesus even raised Lazarus from the dead and others as well. However, their resurrection was not like Jesus. Jesus was raised to eternal life, the first fruit to the resurrection. After him, the rest of us look forward to the day when we too are raised with him. But Lazarus died again. Jesus, until this day, is the only one raised to eternal life. But he did many miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of this fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. What does it mean to be a Christian? To be a Christian, as Jesse was, means that you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what a Christian is. A Christian is not first a person who's adopted a a certain type of moral life, though Jesse did that. A Christian is not a person who lives by a certain ethic or certain commandments. A Christian, first and foremost, believes in the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In fact, Peter, when he spoke these words, said, we are witnesses of this fact. Peter placed his life on the line and was later crucified upside down himself because he was an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. And that gave him such a confidence and such a hope that death itself could not take away. And that has been the experience of Christians now for 2,000 years. That because Jesus lives, we know we too will one day live. And therefore, though grief is the common experience of mankind, joy, And hope, which looks forward to a better day, that is a gift that God has given to those who love him and to those who know him. Now, as has been said, Jesse was a, well, I read, people use words to describe Jesse on his Facebook page, beautiful soul, caring friend, A person who is at peace, as his mom so well said, a person who let you know how things were in his life at any given moment, and yet a person who deep down had this settled sense of peace. How is that? It's because Jesse gave his life to Jesus, and Jesus began his work of transformation in Jesse's life. And gave Jesse, as he does all his children, because to know Jesus is to become a child of God and a brother with Jesus or a sister with Jesus. And God gave Jesse this this, uh, transformed life so that he could go through some difficult days and not lose hope. Now, someone might ask, but why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Why did Jesus have to experience the resurrection from the dead? And the Bible tells us that Jesus died on the cross because Jesse was not a perfect man. (laughs) And neither am I, and neither are you. The Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, that every human being who's ever lived has sinned, and that the wages of sin is death. In other words, we have earned death through our sin. What does it mean to sin? Sometimes we think, well, to sin is to tell a lie or do something I shouldn't do, and certainly that could be true, and it is. But ultimately, when the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, it essentially means we've all basically looked up to God in our hearts. We probably wouldn't physically do this, but looked up and and shaken our fist 
and said, no, God, I'm not going to live the way you want me to live. I'm not going to trust you. I'm not going to give my life to you. Maybe I won't even believe in you. No, no. I'm going to live life my way, not your way. And that is sin. Jesus never sinned against his father. Jesus did live a perfect life. And by that, Jesus became the perfect sacrifice for sin. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, his blood provides a covering, a cleansing of our sin. You see, we are forgiven through Jesus, but we are also cleansed. So that when God looks at us, he does not see our sinfulness, but he sees the perfection of his son Jesus. He does not see Jesse as he was in this earthly life. He sees him much more like Marcy saw him in that dream. Perfect. Not just perfect physically, but perfect spiritually, morally, emotionally. Clean. Perfect. Now you might ask, what is the proper response that a person ought have When, deep down in their heart, they come to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, well, that was the question that those listening to Peter had. Peter said, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers... What shall we do? That may be your question. You may say, I've lived a certain kind of life for a long, long time. But I too want hope. I too want joy. I too want eternal life. What shall I do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off and for all whom our Lord God will call. Two actions Peter mentions, repentance and baptism. Repentance means I'll turn around. No longer will I shake my fist at God and say, no, I don't want your life, I want my life. Repentance means I turn back to God and say, yes. I trust you. I believe in you. I believe in the historical fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I confess that, that Jesus is Lord. That's what repentance means. Baptism is our public coming out. It's the way we tell the world. Baptism, the word literally means to be immersed. It's a picture of death and burial and resurrection. Baptism is the way a Christian tells the world I am now a follower of Jesus. I have died to my old life. I'm resurrected to a new life. If you've never uh, confessed Jesus in that way, that's the way this church and so many churches enable you to declare your faith through the waters of baptism. And then it says, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Don't you want more than this world has to offer? Peter's generation was corrupt, to be certain. Is ours any less corrupt? Isn't there more? Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That established the first church, the church in Jerusalem, 3,000, just days after Jesus ascended to heaven, said yes to Jesus and were baptized. It may well be that there are those here who say, I need that. I want more than 33 years out of life on this earth. That's what Jesse had. Maybe you'll get that. Maybe you've gotten that. But hey, if you live to 103 but you have to say goodbye to everyone you know and love forever and forever, thinking you will never, ever see them again, that would still be horrible. 
even at 103. Jesus provides the opportunity to be a forever family. A forever family of God's people. And we will know each other up there. That word hope, we've used that word a lot. We've sung about the hope we have. The, the Bible uses the word hope and has several images it uses to express what hope is. Joel, the prophet Joel, said hope is like a harbor. When you're out on the riptides of the sea and life gets rough, hope is like a safe harbor into which you come and find life restored. We are also told that hope is like an anchor, an anchor for the soul. When the seas are rough and you're drifting about, you anchor your hope and your life on Jesus. Jesus is certain. Jesus is real. Jesus provides the only foundation for life that will not shake and crumble when things get tough. One of my favorite images is in the prophet Hosea who says hope is like a doorway. It may be that you feel like you're in a room with no exits. That's the image. That's the picture. You're in a room and there's no way out, no window, no door. And there's hope. Hope is the doorway to a new life. Jesus is that door. In fact, Jesus said of himself, I am the door. He's the door that can open up a new kind of life for you and make you ready to stand before God one day as a sinner who's had your sin cleansed and forgiven, washed away, and ready to meet God. Whatever we can say about Jesse Campbell, we know he was ready to meet God. His last statement affirms the fact that he believed in God. And when life itself was on the edge, he knew the one place he could turn was not to a dad who would do anything for him or a mom who would give everything for him. He knew when you're at that point, there's only one person who can rescue you. And that's Jesus. That's God. If any of you have need of Christ today, you, in this very moment, you can say, oh God, save me a sinner. Rescue my soul. Cleanse me of my sin and give me new life. And there will be those ready to pray with you, even at the end of this service. God bless you. As you know, Jesse picked all the songs. And this next one is Look on the Bright Side of Life. And um, he was laying in the hospital with meningitis and he couldn't move, he couldn't hear, and he could only barely see out of one side of one eye. And somehow he got his phone and sent a text to Facebook and said, okay, could use a little cheering up. And any of my friends out there that want to sing, look on the bright side of life. So some of his buddies came down to the hospital, his trivia buddies. They brought their ukulele. He put his hand on the ukulele so he could feel the vibrations. And they put on the iPad in big letters the words to the song. And they all sang it together. And so this is one of the songs that he requested for today. Just a second, Dave. I'm Karen Seifs, and first, I am also the Director of Music at Community Presbyterian, and my congregation sends their love and support and grace to you and your family. Um, if there is anybody here from the theater community who wants to come up and at least give me some moral support up here, that would be wonderful. It doesn't matter if you really sing or not. Come on up. <laughs> 
Um, I met Jesse about eight years ago, and when he was doing Evil Dead, I was the music director, um, and he, um, he asked me for some private vocal help, and I had to tell him that I could only do that for the leads, and of course he was Dr. Novi, so he considered that to be worthy of getting help, so I, <laughs> I, I did, I gave him several voice lessons, and um, this is actually the song that we worked on in our lessons. He was auditioning for Spam a lot, and so this is really special to me. I got to be friends with Jesse through the theater community, um, stand-up comedy, and improv, and I was privileged to sit in some of those trivia games with him, and he won for us. Um, and he got to know my son, Sean, through Facebook from the time he was 13, and they formed a bond. And he would take Sean with him to movies, and not long after he got out of the hospital and was starting to get around, he and his caregiver came to Sean's 18th birthday party with always appropriate Star Wars gifts and brought me the perfect uh, Sleeping Beauty gift. And um, so Jesse has meant a lot to our family. We kept Jack for a week for him when he was in Disneyland. I'm still stalling until somebody comes up here to sing with me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we just got this music, and I'm going to do my best to lead through this version of Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. I really need help with the whistling. I cannot whistle to save my life. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> Can you do that? <laughs> Will you whistle that with me and then sing along? Okay. All right. I guess I'm on my own. <laughs> in life are bad they can really make you mad other things just make you swear and curse when you're chewing on life's gristle don't grumble give a whistle and this will help things turn out for the best and you can sing this part with me and always look on the bright side of life <laughs> Always look on the right side of life. If life seems jolly rotten, something you've forgotten, that that's to laugh and smile and dance and sing. When you're feeling in the dumps, don't be silly chumps. Just first your lists and whistle, that's the thing. And always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> always look on the right side of life. For life is quite absurd, and death's the final word. You must always face the curtain with a bow. Forget about your sin. Give the audience a grin. Enjoy it, it's your last chance anyhow. Always look on the bright side of life. Just before you draw your terminal breath, For life is quite absurd, and death's the final word. Life's a laugh, and death's a joke, it's true. You'll see it's all a show. Keep them laughing as you go. Just remember that the laugh last is on you. Everybody! Ready? <laughs> Always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the bright side of life. Side of life. Side of life. Side of life.
Wow, thanks. Jesse would have loved that. He would have loved all of all we're doing today. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to some to some uh, friends uh, and kind of communities. Uh, Putnam Point, where Jesse lived. Neighbors, thank you so much for being great neighbors. Ben Park and Rec. Uh, Jesse had signed up for some classes. Uh, he was going to take weightlifting, Zumba, holiday baking, and the holiday dance where he would be the, uh, the DJ. Thank you to the Ben Theater community. You guys were so special to him. And I know there's some co-workers here today from Regal Old Mill uh, Cinema uh, 16. Thank you for being here. The trivia teams, Jesse loved that. Uh, Foundry Church, thanks you guys. Stand-up comedy uh, people. Karaoke and HBC. Do you realize, you realize, don't you, that this morning we had our two services, all this stuff wasn't here. We didn't know. So uh, when, by the time we finished and we started, they, they put it up. So thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. By the way, speaking of that, I know we're taking a little longer than a normal service because it's not a normal thing. But the gym, don't miss the gym. We got some snacks down there, and it's a museum. It's a Jesse Museum. You got to see it. I mean, just don't miss it. Uh, neighborhood business owners in Bend and, and workers, thank you. Full access, good to go. Uh, physicians and medical professionals in the uh, community, and f personally for me, uh, area pastors. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, in the way that you have walked beside me. I can see why you love my son, Jesse. He is funny and interesting and always up for an adventure, kind and giving and outgoing and warm, but he was authentic. And he tried to explain something to me that he said, Dad, in theater, is called... Um, is it breaking the fourth wall or crossing the fourth wall? Breaking. Breaking the fourth wall. And he said that's when a, a, a somebody on, in a play or in a stage breaks character and speaks directly to the audience. And I think that's the way Jesse lived his life. He was so authentic and so real that he was constantly breaking the fourth wall. He loved people. And he opened himself up to people. So people from lots of different walks of life with lots of different interests, loved him. We are crushed and heartbroken. I don't know what I'm going to do on Monday mornings and Saturday mornings when I would go to breakfast with him. But I know this, because of Jesus, I expect to be united with my son. Yeah. So, yeah. We want to give you a chance to say a word. There are two microphones here, and I'm going to ask my daughter Katie to come to this microphone, and Linda McWright, would you come to this one? And this will go a lot quicker if we go to these mics and then kind of take turns. So if you'd like to say a word and tell a story, uh, we got some kids, so keep it PG, please. Um, would you please just line up at one of these mics? Thanks, Katie. So I hope you guys don't mind. I uh, wrote down a few things, so I may stay kind of close to my little script here. Um, but I'm Katie Campbell, otherwise known as Jesse's sister. And um, but I just want to, for a second, um, anyone that has a sibling with special needs, um, you grow up a little bit differently. And that's OK. Um, it's always going to be a little different for your whole life. And um, every situation is a little bit different. And that's okay too. Um, but for me, I have been interrupted my whole life. <laughs> my whole life. I don't know that I finished my own sentence um, until I was a teenager and could combat him. <laughs> but um, is it okay if I take this out of the stand? Is that all right? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so some of you can imagine what it would be like to grow up with a sibling with special needs, and some of you know. Um, just how different it can really be. Um, but I'm telling you, you guys have some big shoes to fill as far as interrupting me, so I expect big things from you, okay? <laughs> um, but I started a blog a while ago just sharing experiences of being a sister of someone with special needs, and it's called Being the Other Child. And I pulled a quote from the head of that website, um, and it says, whether they're young or old, boy or girl, teenager or adult, the brothers and sisters of people with special needs have much to say if they're given the chance to speak, <laughs> right? And guys, I got to tell you, um, the silence the last couple weeks has at times been really deafening to me, really quiet. Yeah. So now it's my turn to speak. 
Um, so I just want to share a couple of quick stories with you. Um, and I may, you know, not always be able to find all the words without my partner to be, al be able to be there and help me finish my stories, <laughs> which is a nice way of interrupting, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but Jesse was always the person in my life who wanted to bring me my first pumpkin spice chai of the season. Um, he took me on some of the most amazing adventures, and we met some of the most amazing people. Um, he even, at our most recent adventure to Comic-Con in Portland, got the cast, some of the cast of The Office, to sing happy birthday to me from the stage. Um, they did the harmony parts and everything. It was really, really special. Um, but I'm going to tell you guys something. And you can't tell anybody else, okay? So this is a special private hearing. Um, but I have actually had the cops called on me in my life. Would you believe it? <laughs> All right? So I want you to imagine with me six-year-old Katie and 10-year-old Jesse, <laughs> okay? And my parents had just gone just around the corner. Uh, we were pretty at times, self-sufficient kids, you know, and it was a very safe neighborhood. Um, they just gone around the corner to the convenience store to get a couple things. And as most siblings do, and you guys, my perspective of some of these stories is gonna be a little different from some of the other stories you might hear today because I'm a sister, right? <laughs> so we had some little special interactions um, as most siblings do. So sometimes Jesse would take my stuff, right? He'd take my diary, he'd take my stuffed animals, you know, whatever was important to me at that time, just little sibling rivalries. Um, but six-year-old Katie had my diary taken, he took it in his room, and I was so mad in that moment. I was fuming. So Jesse, growing up with his certain special abilities or disabilities that he had and abilities, um, his nerve endings were always really sensitive, right? So I, like your normal sibling relationship, couldn't just haul off and punch my brother anytime I wanted. Couldn't do that. That's not an option with somebody like Jesse. So six-year-old Katie, standing outside Jesse's room, coming to the conclusion, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to punch my brother in the arm as hard as I can, right? I'm like this tall. <laughs> it's going to happen. I'm going to punch him. Um, so I go in that room and I do it. I punch him in the arm as hard as I can, and he screams, and he goes, I'm calling the cops! And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever, you know, and I grabbed my diary, walked off, and went into my room, and would you believe it? He called the cops! <laughs> Kids, don't do that if your sister punches you in the arm, right? They had been learning in school about appropriate times, when to call and when not to call, <laughs> 911. Um, and he called the cops on me, six-year-old Katie. He said, my sister's punching me. I was like, oh, no, okay. <laughs> parents are gone. When are they coming back? What are we going to do? They have to come. So parents came back just a few minutes before the cops arrived. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mom, Dad, welcome home. Cops are on their way. Don't panic. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so they, um, they came, you know, because you have to respond to a call like that. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, but we got a nice, uh, good talking to from the police <laughs> that day. <laughs> um, and just another quick little, uh, I don't know, insight into what it's like to be his sister. Um, a few years ago, we were, um, let's see, I was working retail at the time, um, and it was during a holiday season. I was really tired, so I had a day off. I was sleeping in. It was great. And my mom says, hey, do you want to come grab lunch with us? We're going to Mazatlan down the street. And I was like, you know, I'm still in my pajamas. It's like 11.30 a.m. I don't really want to, I'm not, I'm not ready for the day. Um, not ready for the day. And she goes, oh, it's okay. It's just, it's just family. It's just my mom, my dad, and Jesse. I was like, okay, are you sure? She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on down. Just throw some jeans on. It'll be fine. Okay. I have been known on occasion to roll out of bed, throw a hat on, throw some jeans on, and be ready for the day, right? From time to time, we can all do that. So... I walk into Mazatlan, and I turn my head around the corner, and I see a party of 10 sitting at this table with very close family and friends that I had no idea were going to be there. So, all right, now I have to make the best of this situation. <laughs> so I walk in, I sit down next to my family, and I say, guys, I would have at least showered if I had known that we were going to have people here. <laughs> and Jesse, who has no filter, says, really loudly, oh, it's okay, Katie, I don't think that guy showered either. You're fine. 
Okay. Thanks, bro. That's the same kind of situation where, you know, you're saying something in a quiet, intimate restaurant, you know, that you don't want people to hear, and you're like kicking somebody gently under the table, and he would say, stop kicking me! Ow, you did it again! Right? So, you can't ever have any secrets with Jesse. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are just, just a couple of little stories um, that kind of stud- stood out in my mind as we were thinking about things. Um, But one thing I do know for sure, you know, all humor aside, um, I wouldn't be a fraction of the person that I am today if it weren't for my brother. Not even close. Um, And each of you that are here today, every single one of you had some kind of connection with Jesse, and you played some kind of role in his life. Um, And you made his life that was already really exciting and fun. It was hard at times, but really fun. Um, You made that even better and even more special. Um, So thank you guys, thank you all for everything that you've done for my brother and for my family. Hi, my name's Linda, and I've come recently to find out that sometimes I was called the drill sergeant. (laughs) I was an assistant to Jesse for a little over six years, and I was, I had to help him with daily things so sometimes our days went great and sometimes they didn't go so great there was one day I got fired six times (laughs) in one day and last June I retired and ever since then Jesse had tried to get me to come back full time and his last offer was a million dollars and a trip to Europe And I told him, I said, you do know that's just pears your parents are raising on that tree in the backyard, right? (laughs) And he said, Linda, you're so obsessed with money. (laughs) He was always telling me I was was obsessed with getting him to work on time. I was obsessed, obsessed with all kinds of things. Sometimes we would be in line at Starbucks, and all of a sudden, Jesse would turn around and say, we'll buy everybody's coffee. And I say, Jesse, you got any money in your wallet? And he's going, no. <laughs> so that's kind of how it went. And sometimes if we had a really hard time, he had animals that he would act out. And Lily had, was a puppy with Asperger's, and so he would tell Lily's side and always say it. And then Rosie was kind of the voice of reason, but then Rosie would tell her side, Jesse doing both of them. When he got done, he goes, Linda, how come Rosie always sides with you? <laughs> so we he the other thing he liked to do is he loved Christmas music. Well, he loved all kinds of music. And he lo- I had satellite radio in my car. And so after he lost his hearing, I selfishly thought I would get to pick the radio station. <laughs> but it turns out Jesse had million songs in his head. So he always turned it on the Broadway station loudly. And he would know the words. And here, after he'd had his cochlear implant and stuff, he finally, I knew he was hearing music because he always knew the words, but it took a while before he was at the same place the radio was. And he also knew there were certain songs that would get stuck in my head, and he tried his darndest (laughs) to do that. So they start playing Christmas music on October 31st. And we'd have to start looking, listening to Christmas music. And he always tried to find Grandma Got Ran Over by a Reindeer. <laughs> so so that, w- that was kind of how things went with us. But here, the last couple of months, Jesse was never big for hugs. Uh, but lately, he'd been giving a lot more hugs and saying, I love you. And uh, it was a good thing to be loved by Jesse. And he, he was always frustrated by me because since I was old, he thought I should know all the old music and all the old plays and all the old things. But he knew some things I did like, and like he did with a lot of his friends, he would try, he wanted to do something I liked, and he knew I knew I liked Downton Abbey. So he, as soon as the trailer came out, he recorded it for me, and then he got me tickets, and he told his mom, he said, Sorry, Mom, I'll go to Downton Abbey with you, but I've got to take Linda to the premiere. So (laughs) before he went to New York, we got to go to the premiere. (laughs) 
Okay, while David's on this side, if you want to say something, come to this side and get ready here. I have a uh, post from Jesse that I would like to share with you. It's a conversation between Thor and Mr. Rogers uh, of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Mr. Rogers says, this is an impressive hammer that you have there. Would it be okay if I held it? Thor replies, you may certainly try, Sir Rogers of the Hood. <laughs> Mr. Rogers said, is it very heavy? Thor says, there are many who feel, who find it unmovable. Mr. Rogers says, how interesting. It doesn't seem very heavy to me. Mr. Rogers says, but you know, sometimes life is a lot like that. Something that may be very easy for one person may be very difficult for another. Have you found this to be true? Thor says, mm, yes, I have. Mr. Rogers asks, do you know why that is? Thor looks at Mr. Rogers curiously. Mr. Rogers says, I think that it's because everyone is special and unique in different ways. Just because someone has difficulty lifting your hammer doesn't mean that they are not talented in other ways. In fact, I suspect that those individuals can probably do things that you and I would never dream of. All right, thank you. Chantel, you have been so gracious. Thank you for coming in costume, and I think you have another song for us, right? Before I sing this, um, I met Jesse in theater. Um, he came out after uh, The Little Mermaid, and uh, we were out in the audience um, meeting people, and he was just radiating so much joy, and he asked if he could message me later, and I said, yeah, of course. So he messaged me later, and um, it was very special because he said that he just had to let me know that he lost his hearing, and there are very few moments that he could hear a little bit, um, and that in The Little Mermaid, in um, part of your world reprise, uh, he clearly heard one of the first strongest notes that he had heard in a long time. Um, so Jesse and I were always in love with Disneyland. We swapped pins back and forth. We talked. We planned all the time. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to um, honor him with Elsa today is because he actually helped us um, set up, my friend and I set up um, being able to go to Regal Cinemas as Anna and Elsa, and he was really excited to see our costumes. Um, so I wanted to honor him with that. Um, this song that I'm going to sing is one that we would kind of sing along back and forth on Facebook all the time. Um, and it is the um, Let It Go reprise from Broadway. Is everyone all right? We are your majesty. Rest assured. so much I want to say, I can say it all beginning with today, it's like, it's like a dream I thought would never be, Elsa. Jesse, you're free, let it go, let it go, show us what you can do. Take this warmth around and send it up above. Goodbye to you, dark and fearless. Fill this world with light and love. And here surrounded by a family and love. I'm never going back. The past is in the
Amen. We're going to pray on behalf of Barry and Marcy and Katie. Thank you for being here today. And following the prayer, I'm going to lead them out uh, to the gym. So I know they want you to come and enjoy what they have there. And you can talk to Barry and Marcy and Katie and the other family members in the gym. But uh, remain seated for a moment or two uh, until I escort them out. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful, God, that we can have friends um, from all aspects of life and community, and we've seen that today, Father. Lord, we thank you that, uh, that you have made a beautiful world for us to enjoy in the days that you've given us on this earth, and a great deal of that beauty is in the people that we get to know and love and live life with. Thank you, Father, for the testimonies from, of various types that have been shared today of Jesse and his life. Father, we mostly commit our lives to you. And we thank you, God, that you have done for Jesse Campbell what no human being can do. Though raised in a home that loved him and shared Jesus with him from his earliest days, uh, Jesse came of his own free will to know you and love you and, and you uh, him. Thank you, Father, for loving Jesse and for doing for him everything that we couldn't. And Lord, we commit our lives to you. We pray, Father, that from, uh, for the remainder of our days that we will strive to seek you and, and love you as you have loved us. And may we do so, Father. And now, Father, we do pray that you would continue to care for this family in the midst of grief and joy, in the midst of gratitude and sadness. Continue, Father, to show yourself strong and loving to them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 